It was January of 2014 when a man in Waynesville, Ohio, returned home after working at a nearby prison. Upon entering the home, he could see evidence of a violent struggle. Curiously, two rugs were missing from the home, and his teenage stepson was noticeably absent. By early 2014, 18-year-old Justin Back had graduated from Waynesville High School and he had ambitions to join the Navy, just like his older brother had done. Back in school, Justin was known for his generous nature. He was an avid football player and helped to construct sets for the drama productions. He had been recognised for having perfect attendance. Justin was also a huge music lover and could get lost in music for hours at a time. His favourite band was Green Day, certainly a good choice. Before graduation, Justin had attended the Career Centre where he completed the Fire Science Programme. His instructor, Tim King, described him as quiet, polite and respectful. He recalled, Cadet Back worked hard and always did everything I asked him to do. He came in recently with his Navy recruiter to introduce him to me, and he was excited about going into the Navy. In freshman year, Justin had ran track, but it was football that he truly loved. He wore the number 27 jersey and played as a receiver for the Spartan football team. Justin was also something of an underdog. While he made friends with ease, he always made sure to make friends with those who were struggling. Those who found themselves the victim of bullying, or those who couldn't quite find their clique. He hated the idea of anybody being left out. Justin was also known for his random acts of kindness. His mother Sandy recalled how he would often offer to help carry groceries for elderly people, or step in to stop a fight. As Sandy said, he touched so many lives. Justin had been working in McDonald's for the past three years, but in January of 2014, he quit in preparation for the Navy. He had been scheduled to join the Navy just the following month. Justin lived at home with his mother and stepfather, Sandy and Mark Cates, on Corwin Road in Waynesville. The 28th of January 2014 started out like any regular day for the family. Mark returned to the home at around 7.45pm after finishing his shift in the nearby prison. As soon as he entered the home, he knew that something was wrong. The home was in complete disarray. Tables in the kitchen had been shoved up against a wall. And peculiarly, rugs were missing. It appeared as though a burglary had taken place. So Mark scanned the home to try and figure out what was missing. The items he expected to be stolen, such as the television and computer, were in clear view. He continued in his examination of the home and found that the family safe and gun were missing. His badge and ID from Warren Correctional Institution was also missing. Justin was noticeably absent from the home. Mark's concern escalated when he noticed that Justin's cell phone was in the home. Justin wouldn't have left home without his cell phone, so Mark immediately called 911. Like his room, um, the lamp was knocked off his dresser The uh, in the kitchen. The tables were all shoved up against the wall. The rugs are missing. Investigators responded to the home in minutes. When they entered, it quickly became apparent to them that something much more sinister than a burglary had taken place. There were spots of blood throughout the kitchen and evidence that somebody had attempted to clean up the blood. Detective John Smith describes the scene. 
once I started to remove the carpet and I removed the top layer, which was just the regular carpet, I seen that it had been saturated through to the uh, underlayment or the padding. The search for Justin began, and investigators got their first lead almost immediately. A neighbor of the Cates family informed investigators that he had seen a car parked outside the family's home earlier in the afternoon. He gave a description of the car, and Mark was able to identify who the car belonged to. Justin's old childhood friend, 19-year-old Austin Myers. Mark informed investigators that just the day beforehand, Myers and another young man had come to the home. They'd watched television with Mark and Justin before leaving. Investigators sent out a be on the lookout alert for Myers and his car. They were able to track him down that evening. He was at the home of his friend, 19-year-old Timothy Mosley. Mark identified Mosley as being the other man at the family's home just the day beforehand. Mosley and Myers were both transported to the police headquarters to be interviewed regarding the burglary and the disappearance of Justin. Mosley made a startling confession and told investigators that Justin wasn't coming home. He then directed investigators to where they could find his body. He sent them to Cry Baby Bridge off Fudge Road in Preble County. Hidden behind a log, they found the body of Justin. He had met an extremely brutal demise. He had been choked, beaten, stabbed and shot. It was overkill. Justin had sustained 21 stab wounds and two post-mortem gunshot wounds. He had also been choked with some kind of garrote. In announcing the gruesome discovery to the public, Warren County Sheriff Larry Sims said, For all indications, this was a good young man that was headed to the military. This was a very brutal murder. Mosley and Myers were both arrested in connection with the murder of Justin. The arrest came as a massive surprise to those who knew Justin. Myers and Justin had known one another. They'd been childhood friends when Myers lived nearby, and then they both attended school in Waynesville together. Sandy didn't think that Myers was a good influence on her son, and she told him that they could no longer be friends. Then in the 8th grade, Myers moved to North Mount High School, where he met Mosley. In the wake of the murder and the arrests, tributes for Justin would come flooding in. A makeshift memorial appeared near the entrance to Waynesville High School, where he had been a student. There was a large orange sign which read, R.I.P. Justin, and students wrote words of condolences. The messages left were a true testament to the kind of young man that Justin was growing into. There was one which read, I'll never forget how you stood up for me. Thank you for being such a wonderful person. Another friend, Andrew Beggs, wrote, You were one of the only friends I had, and you were so cool. The school would make preparations and provide counsellors to help both students and teachers make sense of Justin's murder. On the Friday, the life of Justin was celebrated during a memorial at the school's gymnasium. During the service, his friend Miracle Ryan said, Don't let what happened overshadow such a wonderful man's life. A photo montage of Justin's life played on a large screen as friends reminisced about everything they loved about Justin. The constant jokes, the friendly and compassionate demeanour, and his many quirks. His friend Andrew Briggs recollected how Justin and he had become best friends, bonding over their love of Green Day and running track. He said to the crowd, I always had someone to run with. He was so comfortable to talk to. It was announced during the memorial services that donations were being collected at the Waynesville National Bank and Trust to help Justin's family pay for burial expenses. Funeral services had already been offered free of charge, 
by the Stubbs Connor Funeral Home. When Mosley and Myers were arrested, they were brought into separate interrogation rooms. Details of the murder started coming out almost immediately. The murder of Justin had been premeditated. In early 2014, Mosley and Myers had come up with an idea to burglarize a home. Mosley had wanted to raise money to erase a misdemeanor drug charge and join the U.S. Marine Corps. As for Myers, he just needed money in general. He had been homeless and had been couch surfing among various friends' homes. Myers thought of the perfect victim, Justin Back, his friend from school. Since Myers and Justin had been friends, Myers had been inside the Back home on numerous occasions. Meyer said to Mosley that the family had a safe that contained money and a gun, and he said that it was typically wide open. The plan began to materialise. At first, the plan was simply to burglarise the home. The day before Justin was killed, Myers and Mosley drove over to the family home. They anticipated that the home would be empty, but Justin was in. After Myers and Mosley left that afternoon, they went to Waynesville Library and began to chat about their plan. Myers had an idea. Kill Justin back and then steal the safe. The first plan was to give Justin a fatal injection. Mosley suggested that they use cough medicine, so they went to a nearby pharmacy and purchased four boxes of nighttime cold medication. Myers also picked up a bottle of poisonous bug wash. He attempted to purchase the items, but his credit card was declined. He went to a nearby ATM to try and lift out some money, but that too was also declined. Myers and Mosley returned later in the afternoon to Justin's home once more. This time, both Justin and Mark were home. Justin welcomed his old friend, Myers, into the home and welcomed Mosley as well even though he had never met him before. They chatted for a while, before Justin and Mark sat down with Myers and Mosley and watched some television together. Justin and Mark were completely oblivious to the true motivations of the young men. Myers and Mosley left the home that evening, and they drove over to a local McDonald's to discuss their plans even further. They drove past Justin's home that night to scope it out before returning to Mosley's home. As their plan continued to progress, Mosley wrote their ideas down in a journal. They eventually came up with the idea to strangle Justin with a wire and then steal the safe. One note in the journal ominously read, You're going to go into the house. Austin was going to distract him. I was going to choke him. As part of their plan, they decided they would steal some of Justin's clothing to make it look as though he had simply ran away from home. Myers even suggested that they kill Mark as well as Justin and then set the scene to make it look like Mark had killed Justin and then fled. Mosley opposed this addition to the plan and told Myers that it would involve too much work and a greater risk. The planning was finalised, so Mosley and Myers drove over to a Lowe's store in Trotwood. Myers purchased a three-foot length of galvanised steel cable and two metal rope cleats. This was to be used to make a garrote, which is a tool used to strangle somebody. They had decided on using such a tool because they believed that it would result in what they described as a clean kill. From here, the two men returned to Mosley's bedroom and put together the murder weapon. The following morning, Myers and Mosley purchased items to clean up the crime scene, including ammonia. Mosley suggested that the ammonia would destroy any DNA. Myers then suggested purchasing septic enzymes. 
He said to Mosley that the cold would hasten the decomposition process. But if they poured septic enzymes over Justin's body, then it would speed it up. At around 1pm, they drove over to Justin's home. The plan of action was for Myers to distract Justin, while Mosley came up behind him and looped the garrot around his neck. Justin welcomed the Jew into his home and they sat and chatted for a while. At one point, Justin asked Mosley and Myers if they wanted a drink. They saw this as the perfect opportunity to carry out their sadistic plan. As Justin went into the kitchen, Mosley followed him close behind. Justin opened up the fridge and bent down to get a couple of drinks. As soon as he stood back up, Mosley looped the garrote over his head from behind and went to pull it tight. As he was doing so, Myers grabbed Justin to restrain him. Mosley then kicked Justin's feet out from underneath him, and the trio began wrestling on the floor. The wire had become caught on Justin's chin, and a struggle between life and death ensued. Justin was struggling on the kitchen floor, with Myers and Mosley, begging for his life and frantically trying to remove the wire. He knew that as soon as it slipped down his chin and onto his neck, it was game over. Justin kept repeating the word, why? Myers told him to stop struggling, and that it would all be over soon. The plan was, jump him out, put it clean, no blood. But I got him, like, right on the chin. So I started to freak out. I'm just like, shit, this isn't going as planned. I don't know if it was too late to fucking take it back. Right. So... And I don't know what else to do. I pulled out my knife because it was right in my pocket. I had my cargo shorts on and I started stabbing him in the back. Myers told Mosley that the garret wasn't around Justin's neck. Mosley responded by pulling out a knife and stabbing Justin in the back repeatedly. As Justin withered in pain on the kitchen floor, Myers managed to get the garrote around his neck while Mosley continued stabbing him in the back, before stabbing him in the stomach and chest. As Justin lay bleeding to death on his own kitchen floor, Myers stole $100 from his wallet. Mosley and Myers then sought out the safe. They found it in a closet in the master bedroom. They had anticipated that it would be unlocked, but it wasn't. They also found Mark's handgun. They loaded it, and then returned to the kitchen where they cleaned up the scene using the ammonia they had purchased earlier. There were two rugs in the kitchen that they used to mop up some blood. They then wrapped Justin's body in a blanket and stuffed it into the trunk of Mosley's car. They then removed the safe and several other items, including Mark's work identity badge. They entered Justin's bedroom and stole some of his clothing to give the appearance that he had run away from home. Mosley and Myers then drove out in the direction of woods in Preble County. As they drove, the trunk kept springing open, revealing Justin's lifeless body. Once they arrived at the wooded area, they dragged Justin's body out to behind a log. Myers shot his body twice, and then doused him in septic system enzymes that were designed to hasten the decomposition process. The safe that Mosley and Myers had stolen contained just $70. It wasn't nearly the amount that the two killers were suspecting. Once Justin's body was dumped, Mosley and Myers returned to Mosley's home and cleaned themselves up. The murder of Justin had been extremely brutal, and both men were saturated in his blood. The full and detailed confession had come from Mosley. Myers had first of all denied any involvement, before claiming he had no idea that Mosley was going to kill Justin. You ever asked him why this suddenly happened? I didn't want to try to talk about it, because he just killed one of my old friends in front of me. And he had a gun in his pocket. 
evidence pointed to the contrary. After all, it was Myers who had purchased the items to make the garrote and other items. Furthermore, it was Myers who suggested Justin as their target. In fact, Mosley only made the confession from the adjoining room after he heard Myers trying to place the blame solely on him. After hearing him trying to sell me out and make me look like I did everything, uh, it's bullshit. It was, how would I know about the safe? How would I know about the money? Why would I kill someone in cold blood? And he told me about it. What did he tell you? Well, he told me about uh, Justin's house and his stepdad, saying he has a safe, he keeps it cracked open, and he has a gun and a lot of money. How Austin, much money did you think was going to be there? Austin said a good couple thousand. So we were thinking a quick job in and out from Mark makes some money. And then we uh, came up with the plan uh, of taking out Justin because in the way. So he's the brains of the operation. <laughs> pretty, sounds like. pretty much. I was, I was following. You're the much. muscle. Pretty much. Never felt like you hit bone or anything like where it was tough. It was just it was in and out. Really? Uh, I had enough time. I, I stabbed him. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. Nobody. After Mosley made the confession, Investigators spoke once again with Myers to see if he would confess to anything. He says you're the one that pulled the trigger on the gun, and he's already dead. I mean, so all I want to know is I want to know the truth. He says you shot him, and he's very convincing. Did you shoot the gun, or did he? I buy it, too. Yeah. Huh? I he finally admitted to shooting Justin, but after he was already dead, with the confessions, investigators obtained a search warrant for Mosley's home in Clayton, which is west of Dayton. After killing Justin, Mosley and Myers had returned to Mosley's home. Inside the home, investigators found the missing murder weapon, a handgun, as well as the safe and work identification badge and ID of Mark. Mosley and Myers were both charged with aggravated murder and were ordered to be held on $1 million bail respectively. Prosecutors were still considering whether they were going to be seeking the death penalty against both men. Prosecutor David Fornshell wanted to liaise with Justin's parents and consider all of the evidence that had been collected thus far, including lab tests. Ultimately, the prosecutor's office announced that they would be seeking the death penalty if Mosley and Myers were convicted of Justin's murder. The grand jury would then hand down more charges. They were both indicted on charges of aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, aggravated burglary, kidnapping, grand theft with a firearm, tampering with evidence, abuse of a corpse, and safe cracking. Prosecutor Fornshell stated, There's no good reason anything like this should ever happen. They simply wanted to kill and rob Justin back. Mosley and Myers would both plead not guilty to all of the charges filed against them. They were ordered to stand trial on the charges, but in September, Mosley appeared in court where he agreed to a plea agreement. In exchange for his guilty plea, the death penalty was taken off the table Mosley would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. Part of the plea agreement also stipulated that Mosley would need to testify against Myers during his upcoming trial. Prosecutor Fornshell said that he was content in settling to life in prison for Mosley and seeking the death penalty against Myers. Mosley had cooperated fully, even admitting in great detail how he was the one to wield the knife that ended Justin's life. As for Myers, he never cooperated, never accepted responsibility, and never expressed remorse. In fact, Prosecutor Fornshell believed that Myers would have gone on to kill more people. After stealing the $100 from Justin's wallet, he told Mosley he planned on using the money to retrieve his rifle from a pawn shop and then go and kill his mother and stepfather. By the 24th of September 2014, the jury had been selected and the trial was ready to begin. 
The case had created a massive buzz among the community, and precautions were taken to ensure safety. Myers was brought into the courtroom through a new secured entrance, and the courtroom needed to be emptied before he was brought in. This meant that when Justin's loved ones entered the courtroom to sit in the gallery, Myers was already seated at the defendant table. Unlike Mosley, Myers was still facing capital punishment if convicted. Capital punishment in Ohio was still legal, but a moratorium on executions was expected to continue into the following year. At the time, throughout the United States there had been problems with lethal injections, and this led to authorities reconsidering the death penalty. The issue was the fewer drug companies were producing the chemicals needed to perform the executions. This meant that there was a shortage of traditional chemicals, and executions were being carried out with alternative compositions. But these were plagued with problems. In some instances, inmates were alive for up to an hour after they were fatally injected. During opening statements, Prosecutor Fornshell described how Justin was killed on his kitchen floor during a burglary. He said that the burglary could have been carried out without violence, stating, Nobody had to get hurt, but Austin Myers chose to kill. He said that they could have carried out the burglary on any day the home was empty, or they could have waited just two weeks when Justin would have left for the Navy. Defence attorney Gregory Howard postponed his opening statements. He wanted to leave it until the beginning of his defence, which would follow the prosecution's case. The first witness to testify was Timothy Mosley, the star witness in the trial. On the witness stand, he made the confession that it was him who killed Justin, as opposed to Myers. He said that he was unable to strangle Justin with the garrote which he described as a choke wire. He said to the jury, That's pretty much when I panicked. I pulled out my knife and started to stab Justin in the back. Uh, obviously, Justin was trying to put up a fight, and just he wasn't overpowering us. A few, almost like moments, a few moments after, uh, Justin was trying to ask, ask us why. To, he was cleaning the stop. And pretty much begging for his life. What did Austin say in response to these questions and statements that Justin Back is making as he's attempting to kill him? In the, in the lines of, it's all right, um, it's almost over. He told the jury about his motivation to burglarize Justin's home, explaining how he needed money to erase his misdemeanor drug conviction. Defense attorney Howard said, you needed a way out. While Mosley confessed to inflicting the fatal injuries, he said that it was Myers who had planned the entire thing. After all, Myers was the only one out of the two who actually knew Justin. Testimony was also presented which revealed that Myers had considered killing Mark, as well as Justin. During closing arguments, Prosecutor Fornshell urged the jury to convict Myers for his role in planning the crime. He reminded the jury that he had purchased the materials to fashion the murder weapon, the materials to clean up the crime scene, and reminded them that he had helped dispose of Justin's body. He stated, If the intention is to commit burglary, why do you need septic enzymes? They poured it on his body to try to decompose the body. Why do you buy something to decompose a body if all you're going to do is knock him unconscious? Prosecutor Fornshell said that the initial plan may have just been burglary, but it was evident that these plans had evolved, and as he said, Myers had numerous opportunities to stop the murder. But as he said, the goal was to kill Justin. Defence attorney John Caspar countered this. He said that the jury should hold Mosley accountable, not Myers. He stated, Austin Myers didn't kill. Timothy Mosley killed. The jury were sent off to deliberate. 
They deliberated for around five hours before returning with a verdict. They found Austin Myers guilty of the aggravated murder of Justin Back. They also found him guilty of all the other charges against him. As the verdict was read aloud, Myers showed no semblance of emotion. The conviction meant that the case entered its next phase, the sentencing phase. Prosecutors were seeking a death sentence. Prosecutor Fornshell said, Austin Myers chose to kill. As a right, he forfeited his right to live. Defence Howard urged the jury not to feel sorry for Myers, but instead sentence him to a lifetime of mornings waking up in prison as a reminder of what he had done. He stated, Every day he'll have to wake up and think about where he put himself. He also pointed towards Myers' youth and his lack of a criminal record. Victim impact statements were presented. Justin's mother, Sandy, spoke first. Austin could have stopped it, but tells Justin, it's okay, it's almost over. You could have changed your mind many times, but you didn't. Especially when Justin was begging for his life. Barney Back, Justin's biological father, also addressed Myers. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you how much I hate you. That is without question. I would just hope that every time you close your eyes at night, you see my my son Justin. Myers would then testify on his own behalf during the sentencing phase. It was the first time he had spoken publicly since his arrest. Uh, yeah. What's your name? Austin Myers. Austin, is there something that you would like to say to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes. Go ahead. I can only imagine the pain and loss felt by Mark and Sandy Cates and by Jake and Back, Justin's brother. I have brothers and sisters myself. I can only imagine what it would be like to lose one of them. I'm sorry that this happened. I know that doesn't bring Justin back, but I'm sorry. I wish I could go back in time and stop this before it even happened, but I can't. I hate for any family to go through such pain and suffering as this. To lose your son, I can't imagine. To lose your brother. If you choose for me to die, it's only going to cause more pain and suffering for another family. Not me. It won't hurt me. I won't feel anything. It's going to hurt more innocent people. My mom and my dad, and my brothers Bryce and Josh over there, and Carson and Sage, to my sisters Alex and Jenna and Eva and Cammy, the people that I love. I'm asking you not to do this to my brothers and my sisters who love me and look up to me. I ask you not to spread this pain any further to any more innocent people. The terrible events of this past January have caused more than enough pain already. If you kill me, it won't fix anything. It won't bring Justin back. It's only going to hurt more innocent people. I don't want to hurt people. I'm not asking you to spare my life so I can hurt anyone. I want to help people. I want to help stop tragedies like this from happening. All I'm asking you for is a chance for me to become a better person. Meyer's parents and his younger brother would appeal for his life. His mother, Danielle Copeland described him as a gifted pianist who had a high academic aptitude and a happy childhood. She stated, As a toddler, 
he could toddle over and point out a middle C, no problem. He took to it quite well. She went on to describe how Myers had began to change when she divorced his father, and he moved to the Dayton area with his dad. Myers had turned to self-harm, and he once shot himself in the leg with a pellet gun. He was treated as an inpatient for a week at a psychiatric facility, and he dropped out of high school. Myers' father, Greg, said that he was disappointed by what his son had done, but said that he was a great mentor for the blended family. He stated, I think he played the role of big brother very well. I love my son very much. He's very important to me. During closing arguments, prosecutors presented a photo montage of Justin, showing him beaming from ear to ear in a number of photographs. They depicted his life with childhood photographs and photographs of Justin as he developed into a young man. The montage finished with Justin's 11th grade school photo. Once again, the jury were sent off to deliberate. Ultimately, they sentenced Austin Myers to death. As the sentence was read aloud, his mother burst into tears. But once again, Myers showed no semblance of emotion. The ultimate decision on Myers' fate would be up to Judge Donald Oda. Once again, Myers was given the opportunity to plead for his life. He stated, Although I made a horrible mistake, I'm only 19 years old. There's a lot of good things I can do with my life, if you let me keep it. Myers' mother would also plead for her son's life, by a statement which was read by Defence Howard. It read in part, We need him to exist, to live. Judge Oda followed the jury's recommendations and sentenced Myers to death. Judge Oda said that he had weighed up a list of factors, including Myers' youth and his lack of a prior criminal record. He also weighed up his lack of remorse and the lead role he played in planning the murder and robbery. Judge Oda said that without Myers, Mosley would not have had any real disposition to kill. Myers was the one who chose Justin as their victim, and if it wasn't for Myers, Justin would still be alive. In handing down the sentence, Austin Myers had just become the youngest death row inmate in Ohio. Outside of court, Sandy said, It's bittersweet. It's justice for Justin, but it's never going to bring Justin back. From court, Myers was taken to the state's correctional reception centre in Orient. From here, he would be transported to Chillicothe Correctional Institution. With the sentence of Myers handed down, it was now time for Mosley to be sentenced. During the hearing, prosecutors once again described the murder of Justin. Mosley paused the hearing after saying that he was feeling sick. A trash can and a glass of water was brought out to him, and the hearing continued. Mosley was handed a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. He was allowed to make a statement, and he addressed Justin's family. Day or night that goes by that it doesn't haunt me of what I did. And there's absolutely no excuse. And I just want you guys to know that I really am sorry. I keep asking myself the past nine and a half months why I did it. And I I just can't give you that answer right now. I hope someday that I will be able to give you that answer. I just wanted to say that I really am sorry for what, I, for what I've done. There's, there's no excuses for what has happened. After Mosley pleaded guilty and the sentence was handed down, Sandy and Mosley's mother, Deborah Stewart, shared an embrace. Prosecutor Fornchow commented, When you see this, you understand. There had always been with Tim an acceptance of responsibility that was completely different from what you ever saw with Austin Myers. Sandy had acknowledged that Mosley had accepted responsibility for killing her son, but she questioned why he stabbed him to death while he pleaded for his life. She stated, 
I don't understand how you could take the life of someone you just met. Why couldn't you see Justin was giving you another path? With the two sentences handed down, a new law was proposed in Ohio in honour of Justin. It was called Justin's Law. Under Ohio law, adult inmates serving sentences for aggravated murder become eligible for parole after 25 years. Justin's Law would add 35, 45 and 55-year mandatory prison terms to the range of sentences that are available under aggravated murder. The law was proposed by Sandy and Mark, who said that they hoped tougher sentences would give pause to teenage killers and delay or reduce the number of crimes that are committed by parole ease. Sandy said, If we can save at least one life, Justin didn't die in vain. Justin's law was just one of the things that the Cateses were campaigning for in order to remember Justin and to help others who were going through something similar. They also developed a website, rememberingjustin.net, where they blogged and offered resources to those going through the grieving process. The one-year anniversary of Justin's murder rolled around in January of 2015. To honour Justin, Sandy and Mark encouraged people to perform random acts of kindness. Sandy stated, He touched so many lives while he was here. He's still doing that. They asked for people to do a good deed in honour of Justin's memory. They had also established a memorial fund called the Justin Back Memorial Scholarship Fund. And Waynesville High School sold prank bracelets with the words random acts of kindness emblazoned on them. All proceeds were going to the memorial fund. Mosley appealed his sentence of life in prison without parole shortly thereafter. He argued that his guilty plea was invalid because the court didn't advise him of the minimum penalty involved for his aggravated murder charge. His appeal was denied. Early the following year, the US Supreme Court ruled the people serving life sentences for murders they committed as juveniles must have a chance to seek their freedom. However, it didn't apply to Mosley or Myers because it only impacted cases involving people who were sentenced for crimes they committed before they were 18 years old. In April, the Ohio Law of Representatives passed Justin's Law. This meant that going forward, a judge could choose whether to grant parole for those convicted of aggravated murder after 35, 40, 45, 50 or 55 years. It also expanded the list of aggravated circumstances under which murders committed purposefully and with prior calculation and design are classified as aggravated murders. There would be much debate regarding the disparity in the punishments of Mosley and Myers. Mosley had been the one to physically kill Justin, but he was serving a life sentence while Myers, who had planned it, was sentenced to death. Some thought that the death sentence was too extreme. Myers would then appeal his death sentence, with his attorney, Timothy McKenna, sharing his belief that he should be resentenced to life in prison without parole, like his co-defendant. He stated, the state is arguing that both defendants planned the murder. Both are equally culpable. If you believe that, then why is our client getting the death penalty and the other guy is getting life without parole? Prosecutor Fornchell defended his decision in seeking death. He said that if anybody deserved any degree of mercy, it was Mosley, not Myers. While Mosley had been the one to physically kill Justin, he had been fully cooperative, giving investigators evidence that incriminated not only Myers, but himself as well. Typically, when a murder involves two defendants, they'll oftentimes point the finger at the other person to try and lessen their culpability. But Mosley didn't do this. He fully admitted to his role. He further said that there was never any indication that Myers was wanting to plead guilty. It was a problematic scenario, 
in which the punishment wasn't based on the level of culpability, but instead on who decided to cooperate with investigators. Justin's stepfather, Mark, commented on this, stating, Myers was the brains, but Mosley was the weapon that he used. He came up with the plans to do it. He chose to get Mosley to help him. He chose Justin. Sandy also commented, He had a choice. Justin didn't have a choice. He could have stopped it. He could have called 911. He could have helped save Justin, but he didn't. Again, that was a choice. Executions wherein the person being executed did not directly kill the victim are extremely rare. There are only 10 such instances which don't involve contract killings. Meyer's appeal was heard at the Ohio Supreme Court in December of 2017. He argued that he was only an accomplice and was less culpable than Mosley, who he described as the principal offender. He once again claimed that he didn't know that Mosley was going to kill Justin. It was kind of ironic, considering he had purchased the items for the garrot, which is nothing less than a murder weapon. The court would unanimously uphold the death sentence for Myers. Justice Patrick DeWine cited evidence of Myers' extensive involvement in the planning and execution of Justin's murder in rejecting the appeal. Shortly after the appeal was denied, Myers received his execution date. It was to be the 20th of July, 2022. His defence team would immediately file a motion to overturn the conviction and call for a new trial, or alternatively, resentence Myers to life in prison without parole. The motion was denied. Another appeal was filed in 2019, and this appeal was once again denied. By July of 2021, Myers had just one year left before his execution date. He filed a motion to delay his execution and filed another appeal. His stay of execution was granted until his appeal was complete. The execution date came and went, but Austin Myers' appeal is still pending. Justin Bagg was truly in the prime of his life. He'd just graduated from high school and was looking forward to enrolling in the Navy. His mother had always warned him about his old friend, Austin Myers. But never in a million years did he envision that his own friend would secretly be plotting his murder. While Myers may not have been the one to wield the murder weapon, Justin would still be alive if it wasn't for him. Austin Myers is currently facing execution. His life hangs in the balance as he awaits the outcome of his appeal. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd like to say a big, massive thank you to my newest Patreon supporter, Caroline. Morbidology is a one-woman podcast, so the support on Patreon seriously goes such a long way, and I am eternally grateful. If you want more episodes of Morbidology, you can join me on Patreon, where I upload bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus as well as ad-free and early release episodes and behind the scenes. If you enjoy the show, could you please consider leaving me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify? If you're feeling super generous, you can even leave a written review. Reviews are an easy way to support a show that you like, and I really do love to hear your feedback. Also remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. And please stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a promo for the amazing podcast, Cryptic Soup. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week. Hey! 
Hey you. Yeah, you. The one hearing us right now. Welcome to Cryptic Soup. I'm Thena. And I'm Kylie. We wanted to say hey and tell you about our podcast. It's a podcast we both host where we talk crimes, cryptids, murders, and a lot of wild stuff in between. You can find Mothman, Jeffrey Dahmer, SeaWorld, Spectrophilia, Casey Anthony, or even Skinwalker Ranch to be just a few of the crazy topics we cover. We even do some fun urban legends to make you feel like a kid at the campfire again. We're just two best friends hanging out, diving into all the things that your coworkers think you're a weirdo for wanting to talk about. We have a new episode every Tuesday at 3 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're always open for case suggestions. Our Instagram is at Cryptic Soup Pod, where our DMs are always open, so slide on in. We always want to hear your opinions about any cases and episodes we cover. You can find our episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most podcasting platforms. At Cryptic Soup Pod, the menu is always overflowing with crazy topics you'll want to hear about. So join the conversation today and come hang out with us. Stay 